Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, at the end of a very long year, hope. It's a, an exceptional day for Canada. I mean, the geek in me is amazed. Canada approves the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. We lay out the road ahead in the weeks to come and into 2021, and the new warnings for those with allergies. Plus, how the third in the world approval process went down on such a compressed timetable. I'm going to speak one on one with Health Canada's chief medical advisor. Also tonight, the second wave gets worse. Quebec delays surgeries again as the province scrambles to make room for COVID patients. My chance to get having a surgery in 2021 or is getting slimmer and slimmer. It seems like the rules were changed last minute to me. Why are some Canadians seeing their CERB payments clawed back? And what will you do when you get the shot? fly somewhere very hot and lay on a beach. And what it means for those on the front lines. It's something that we have all wanted for a long time. This is The National. We have made it through 274 long, frightening, devastating days in this pandemic. A lot of them, many wish they could forget. But this day, December 9th, 2020, is one to remember. The day Health Canada approved the first COVID-19 vaccine for use in this country. At last, we have a reason to feel optimistic and excited about returning to the lives we led pre-COVID. The vaccine is the one from Pfizer-BioNTech, and while it'll be a few more days before inoculations can begin, today's announcement is a critical early step in putting the pandemic behind us. What happens next will be a huge undertaking, getting the vaccine and giving it. David Cochran with the rollout plan and when you could get your shot. This is a critical milestone in our fight against COVID-19. After a grim and grueling year, finally some hope. The largest vaccination program in Canada's history can begin. We concluded that, was, that there was strong evidence supporting that the benefits of the vaccine outweighed the risks. Honourable Prime Minister. This is a big deal, Mr. Speaker. It is a good news day for Canadians. Uh, we will see 30,000 vaccines begin to arrive next week with many more on the horizon. That horizon is 249,000 doses by the end of December. Millions more in the new year from Pfizer alone. It won't be enough for everyone and it won't be for everyone. Only for people 16 and older because of the lack of clinical data on children. The distribution networks are in place for all of Canada's anticipated COVID-19 vaccines. It will start small but ramp up as manufacturing scales up and as other vaccines get approved for use. As we roll into spring and summer, we anticipate a steep increase in, in vaccine availability. Distribution will also become easier as additional vaccines are approved. This has been a marathon and we are nearing the finish line. It's essential we not let our guard down now that marathon will take most of 2021. High-risk populations and essential workers vaccinated first. The target is to start vaccinating the general population in April. The hope is that by next fall, everyone who wants a vaccine has one. No one would have thought, I think, you know, even when we looked back um, at the first discovery of the, of the virus, that um, less than a year later, we'd be authorizing and then distributing uh, vaccines. Okay, so the vaccine's been approved, still needs to get here. So, David, when could we see the first vaccinations? Yeah, it's hard to be precise because there's just so many moving parts in this. The first shipments of the vaccine leave Belgium on Friday. UPS is handling that, so it goes through a series of hubs from Belgium to Germany, from Germany to the UPS Worldport facility in Louisville, Kentucky, and then from Kentucky to the 14 distribution points set up here in Canada. So all of that takes about 36 hours. The best guess is the vaccines in Canada Sunday, Monday, maybe Tuesday. Then it takes a day or two to prep. So midweek next week, the first Canadians should get their first doses of what they hope is the first of several COVID vaccines. Oh, amazing. David Cochran in Ottawa tonight. Thanks, David. You're welcome. So it is a historic day in Canada. So we wanted to bring in one of the doctors at the heart of it all. Health Canada's chief medical advisor, Dr. Supriya Sharma, uh, as you just saw, playing a key role in approving the vaccine. She joins us now from Ottawa. So Dr. Sharma, can you speak to those Canadians who need convincing that this approval could be as rigorous as you say it is, but on such a compressed timeline at the same time. 
Sure. Well, I can understand why people think that, you know, what's the difference between the, the normal review that Health Canada that does, that takes a year, and this that you've managed to do in just a couple of months. And rea in reality, we're holding the vaccines to the same standards. But what we've done is that we put more resources on it. We're doing things, you know, in parallel rather than doing one thing after another. And the most important part is that we've been able to start the review of the materials and look at the data as it's been coming in. So it's been done in real time. I think people don't know how much of the regular review time, you know, is often spent either waiting for data or asking questions and waiting for responses. And that's the other part. When we've gone to the company and asked them questions about their data or about additional information, they've been very quick to respond and we've looked at those right away. So even though the overall time timeline has been shorter. The, the review itself has actually been just as rigorous as we would normally do for a vaccine. But, but I guess the, the pressure for you to arrive at a very specific outcome must have been very real, right? I, I, I mean, we've been talking about distribution of a vaccine that wasn't approved for, for weeks now. So, so when you're weighing, I don't know, the, the urgency of the situation against the trade-off of something like, like not knowing what the long-term effects are, I mean, how do you do that? Like we definitely feel the weight of the decisions that we're making, right? We're all living through COVID together, uh, but that weight uh, doesn't make us necessarily go faster. It just makes it that much more important for us to make sure that everything that we're looking at is done to the, you know, the, the, the nth degree, and we make sure that we're holding this to the same standards. So it's really looking at the data that we have and then making sure that we have commitments to, to, monitor the vaccine as we go forward. So we have some data, they are still big clinical trials. It would be like the size of the clinical trials that we would normally see for vaccines. Right. But in terms of the follow-up data, that's where we wanna make sure that we have really good systems in place to continue to monitor it before, before um, um, we, we make final decisions. I, I have about 20 seconds left. Um, can you tell me which vaccine is next in the approvals pipeline and, and when that approval happens? So we have three more vaccines under review currently. Um, it's one by Moderna, one by AstraZeneca, and then we have the Johnson & Johnson, which is the most recent one. So out of those three, the Moderna vaccine is definitely the one that's most, uh, that's furthest advanced. Um, we are still waiting for some additional information to come in, especially around the manufacturing. So things are progressing really well, um, and we're hoping that we'll be able to, you know, complete the authorization soon, but it really depends on the data that comes in. You know, all the evidence and the, the science uh, really has to be looked at right. and we wait till we see all of that before we make a final decision. Before the end of 2020, do you think? I thought that may be within the realm of possibility, but okay. it really hinges on some information that we're expecting in the next couple of weeks. Dr. Sharma, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This virus has separated us from our loved ones, put livelihoods in jeopardy and left many vulnerable people isolated and alone for many Today's developments are nothing short of life-changing. Greg Rasmussen is getting reaction from Canadians. Let's go sit over here in the chair over here. After months of worry and isolation, there's fresh hope for 100-year-old Dorothy Finnerty and her daughter, Brenda. So there's going to be a vaccination so you don't get the virus. Oh, that's good, hey? They look forward to simple things, a trip to the store or post office without fear of bringing the virus home. It's great news, obviously, for everybody. It feels like there's finally some kind of hope or a light at the end of the tunnel. I would want to hope that she would be first in line. In B.C., only 3,900 doses will be delivered next week. The first will go to long-term care workers. Next will come long-term care residents, then the elderly. The biggest question for many, how long before it's widely available? I think it's fantastic, you know, people's life are finally going to go back to normal because I don't mind getting it as long as I know that myself can be safe and my family can be safe. Along with the hope, a warning to keep on the mask and keep your distance. As in any race, when you see the finish line, you don't stop running, you focus, you dig down deep to find that extra resolve. For hard-hit businesses in places such as Vancouver's Gastown, a tourism hotspot turned cold, it's also fueling hope. So one example here is Melt Confectionery. Uh, this store owner hopes the security provided by a vaccine will allow people to drop online shopping and return to local businesses. So for our business in particular, I think it's going to be a fantastic thing. Um, I know many of our customers or, or people who could potentially come into the store are still hesitant because of COVID. 
But the vaccine comes too late in one vital respect. I unfortunately lost a family member to COVID and uh, would really like hope for no one else to have to experience that same thing. He lost his grandmother to the virus earlier this year and says it's one memory of the pandemic that will never be forgotten. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Now the vaccine rollout continued across the UK today with a warning from health officials to stay vigilant. The idea we can suddenly stop now because the vaccine's here, it, it would, that would be really premature. Long-term care workers and the elderly continue to receive the vaccine today across the UK. It was the first country to begin these vaccinations yesterday. But British health authorities are warning some people to hold off on getting the shot after two health care workers experienced rare allergic reactions. Picodopia takes a closer look at the recommendations there and in Canada. Arlene de Graw didn't hesitate to get the shingles or flu shot, but she's not keen to be one of the first to get the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. They've had some reactions to the drug that they weren't expecting in England, so that makes me a little leery. The two UK healthcare workers have a history of severe allergies and carried EpiPens. Now that we've had this experience in the vulnerable populations, the groups who've been selected as a priority, we get that advice to the field immediately. That advice for people with severe allergies? Hold off on getting vaccinated. For now, Canadians are being told to hold off only if they are allergic to one of the vaccine's components. The vaccine program starts with one shot. A second dose comes 21 days later. The protection kicks in about a week later. Cole Pino, good morning. In an interview with CBC Radio's The Current, the head of Pfizer Canada says the main side effects are expected with the first dose. It's going to be a little bit of pain on injection, some soreness, maybe some, some mild uh, temperature. Uh, maybe a headache, but that's very common with all vaccines. Common because there are signs of an activated immune system, but an overactivated immune system is potentially deadly. It's an allergic response to a specific ingredient in the vaccine, and that actually makes predicting risk difficult. So those who have even reactions to one type are not actually at an increased risk to react to another if it's an allergy because the components differ so widely. Still, the risk of severe allergic reaction to vaccines is rare, about one in a million. Our rollout is a little bit after theirs, so we're going to have all that information and we're going to be able to incorporate that into helping our patients and helping them make the right decisions. And hopefully getting on with lives that have been stuck in park for so long. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, now I got to bring in infectious diseases specialist Dr. Zane Chagla on this because, Dr. Chagla, I'm one of those people. I've got an EpiPen, I've got severe allergies. And here I am wondering if it's possible that getting vaccinated might be dangerous for me. So, so what would my options be if that turns out to be true? So uh, there's a few options. One is, you know, there is probably a component in this vaccine that's triggering the response if this is a true, uh, true issue. And so once it's identified, theoretically, if the Moderna vaccine comes around, doesn't have that component, that may be an option. Uh, if uh, if they have a shared component, then perhaps one of the novel vaccinations down the road. And again, if it's serious and urgent, uh, once the compound is developed, you know, you can try to test with skin testing. There's graded challenges. There's ways we can try to get people even that are allergic vaccinated as long as we kind of get a sense of what's leading to the reaction more than anything else. Right. There, there's a controlled way to do it, but also other alternatives, I guess, in some of the other vaccines potentially. Yeah, exactly. And again, by the time this sorts out, by the time the general population is really invited to get vaccinated, I think we'll have a better sense of what's leading to this and again, what the alternative options are. Dr. Chagla, very good to talk to you. Thank you. No problem. Now, for the overwhelming majority of Canadians, this is all still months away. It will be spring before the first few million people even get their doses. And as Joanna Miliotis tells us, that gives health officials time to share information and sell the shot. When it comes to a COVID-19 vaccine, public health officials know some people want to be first in line. A few won't line up at all. And then there's the so-called movable middle, that critical group of Canadians who could be persuaded to roll up their sleeves. 
Even the best vaccine is only effective if people trust it and agree to take it. And it is all about trust. The Public Health Agency of Canada says a significant minority of Canadians are worried. Like Lisa Cottingham, who has concerns about how fast COVID-19 vaccines are being developed. I'm not an anti-vaxxer, no. No. But I, I feel like, you know, you need to have enough time to be able to properly do the research to, to have all the information to be able to answer all the questions that people might have. There are several strategies in the works to answer those questions. Public health officials are partnering with social media platforms to inform Canadians who are exposed to misinformation online. Q&A sessions will also be offered on public health websites with webinars to help frontline health care providers address individual concerns, including side effects. I mean, it really is providing, you know, honest, open uh, uh, information, really being clear about what we know, what we don't know yet. It will be months before a vaccine is available to most Canadians. By then, tens of thousands of people around the world will have been immunized. This vaccine hesitancy expert says that's enough time for enough Canadians to understand what's at stake. I'm only safe if my family is safe, if my community is safe, if my region's safe, and if my country's safe. And that's going to require 70% of us to get immunized. And when somebody says, oh, I don't think I want to do that, that's a real concern. And we need to find out what it is that they're concerned about. Reassuring the reluctant. It's already started. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. The pandemic has meant politicians have had to deliver hard news to the public. So when it came to today's development, premiers clearly savored the moment. I've got to be frank today and say I'm quite excited about this announcement. It is a sign of optimism for all of us. Sit back and think about this development. The first COVID-19 vaccine is just days away. It will still take weeks before the vaccine really starts to save lives. And the impact of the second wave is here now. Across Canada, there are 3,121 people hospitalized with the virus. That is the highest ever. By this measure, the second wave has now surpassed the first. Now, Quebec's hospitals were still clearing a backlog of surgeries from the first wave. And now procedures are being postponed again. Alison Northcott shows us you don't need to get infected to feel the health impacts from COVID-19. This is where it's hurting the most. For months, Brigitte Unterberg has been waiting for surgery on her hip. It's a chronic pain that I have. She expected a call this summer, but there were delays because of COVID-19. Now she worries she'll have to wait even longer. My chance to get having a surgery in 2021 or is getting slimmer and slimmer. Quebec hospitals are feeling the pressure from the virus, so the province has ordered them to scale back surgeries by half and free up more beds for COVID-19 patients. Premier Francois Legault assured people urgent surgeries will go ahead, but recognized the impact. The increase in hospitalization is putting people on hold for other treatments, surgeries. He's urging people once again to limit their contacts to protect the health care system. The delay concerns some doctors. It's not good news. Dr. Arsène Basmagian says with the lingering backlog from the first wave, delaying procedures that can detect things like cancer and heart conditions could have serious consequences. People's conditions might deteriorate, probably will deteriorate over time, and other people will not be able to get a diagnosis uh, early enough for us to be able to intervene uh, at early stages of disease. He says even when it's not a matter of life and death, quality of life is an issue. That's what weighs on Unterberg. It's not always easy, let's say. But for now, all she can do is keep waiting. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Laval, Quebec. Now, in the spirit of not waiting for a vaccine to push COVID-19 back, Quebec issued an emergency alert with a very clear message. It said, follow the rules and expect consequences for breaking them. Fines have increased for gatherings at homes, not wearing masks, and for businesses not enforcing social distancing regulations. Parts of Alberta woke up today to new restrictions and more come into effect in the coming days, all because the province cannot sustain infection numbers like this. 1,460 new cases to date. Now that's lower than the average of recent days, but per capita, still by far the worst in Canada. Carolyn Dunn shows us how Albertans are facing the reality of the hard days ahead. 
Before the open sign flickers off for a month, this Calgary barbershop is buzzing. We're staying open till uh, midnight from now until Saturday. And uh, we're trying to accommodate as much as we can. Panicked, so I phoned this morning, said I gotta get in here and get my lines drawn. It's my first beard, I gotta make it look good, right? So. Those left shaggy during the last lockdown in spring are not about to let it happen again. I saw the news last night that the closing was coming and made the appointment last night. Social gatherings are already banned, but affected businesses will close on Sunday. Gym owner Jeff Woods says he's more than a little bitter about the timing. I do feel that if we had locked down sooner, we, we could have been uh, or would have been able to control the, the situation. His business hasn't recovered since the first lockdown. Being open has gained him little. Noor Sadid says he's laying off almost all of his restaurant employees, sparing a few to handle what he hopes will be a brisk takeout business and trying to sew a silver lining into the cloud his business and staff are facing. We're going to give away 500 meal to our community to support uh, our community. There's a sense among many this was inevitable. Now, Albertans will wait to see if the sacrifice will finally turn things around. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Ontario's Windsor-Essex County has been hard hit by the pandemic. The, health, the head of its health unit is by now accustomed to the daily tragedy of COVID-19. But today, announcing the death of a 27-year-old man with no underlying health conditions was just too much. It's heartbreaking. I can't imagine what the family's going through. And um, it's, it's just the pandemic continues to, you know, take lives. This past week, every day, I'm announcing a new death. And um, it doesn't matter how old you are, but I don't know. I don't have any words to to actually capture how I really feel. She went on to explain she has a daughter of the same age, a reminder of just how ruthless this virus is. Another reminder comes from south of the border. The United States had its highest one-day increase in deaths today. More than 3,100 deaths were reported. The virus has killed more than 286,000 Americans to date. Now, when lockdowns first hit this spring, nearly 9 million people got financial help through the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. It kept lots of Canadians afloat. But now some of them are getting letters from the CRA saying they may have to pay it back. Catherine Cullen explains why. It was an unwelcome December surprise for Alison Griffiths. So I was completely taken aback and I thought, OK, this is a typo. Letters from the CRA suggesting she and her husband might not have been qualified to receive the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. She says that's $26,000 they may now have to repay. In my new book, Count on Yourself, Take Charge of Your Money. Particularly surprising because Griffiths understands money matters in a career that included work with the CBC. I'm well familiar with the difference between net and gross income. That's the heart of the problem. To get CERB, Canadians had to attest that they made at least $5,000 in 2019 or over the previous 12 months. The CRA's letter says that has to be net income, money made after expenses. <music> Trumpet player Tony Carlucci got a letter from the CRA too. My heart was pounding and I felt like someone just punched me in the stomach. He says he's only being told now that a small pension and investment income aren't counted as net income. It seems like the rules were changed last minute to me. That's what it feels. The Prime Minister says that's not the case. The rules did not change, but we've indicated to Canadians that we will uh, work with them if people made good faith mistakes. The CRA is encouraging people to pay money owing by December 31st, but the agency says that is for tax filing purposes, not a repayment deadline. It's still causing alarm, says this accountant. Panic. People panic about that. And uh, they're really, really worried because people have spent their money for life. They lost job. They lost, they lost their business. And uh, they really panic. Um. For Griffiths, the problem has only grown. Her daughter, Quinn, who is deaf, also got a letter. I know that personally I can't pay back this money. Let's go. Griffiths worries it's those who have the least that will be hurt the most by this. 
Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, as the vaccine comes to Canada, the big question for many, when can I get it? We get food on your table um, to everybody. Us being safe and being vaccinated is important for the public safety as well. Up next, why some essential workers worry they may be overlooked when it comes to vaccine priority. Plus, reaction from the front lines. It means a significant exhale, I would say. Um, it's something that we have all wanted for a long time. What today's news means for healthcare workers. And later. The first thing I would do. The first thing that I want to do. The first thing I would do once I get the vaccine. Looking ahead, your hopes and plans for 2021. We're back in two. Welcome back. Most provinces have outlined who will get the shot first. Frontline healthcare workers, those in long-term care, the elderly, indigenous populations. But after that, the rules aren't so clear. And some fear some essential workers who have kept this country going throughout the pandemic could be overlooked. Ellen Morrow has more. Uber driver Jordan Samuels has spent the pandemic helping others get where they need to go. It hasn't been easy. Dealing with customers who just don't want to follow safety protocols and knowing that this could put my life at risk, it's really emotionally taxing. Recognizing that risk, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization says essential workers should eventually be prioritized for vaccines. After long-term care residents, other seniors, healthcare workers, and adults in Indigenous communities. They're interacting with the public, so we need to think about protecting those people because they are keeping society running. But that distribution would be months away and pose a huge logistical challenge with hundreds of thousands of essential workers across Canada. Many of them come from marginalized communities already bearing a disproportionate burden of the pandemic. There's some skepticism that those workers will actually be prioritized when it's time. The government might need to curate their initiatives to target people's unique circumstances. Beulah Essek works in a Toronto shelter. COVID-19 has really laid bare uh, the inequalities in our system. It's also made clear the true value of essential work, says Amanda Nagy. We get food on your table um, to everybody. Us being safe and being vaccinated is important for the public safety as well. I'm getting essential people to where they need to go and back. But Samuels has her doubts about the vaccine's rollout. The government says that essential workers are heroes, but they're not being treated like heroes. I don't have faith that they will roll out actual vaccination in cash poor, people of color, marginalized neighborhoods. Now she waits and hopes to be proven wrong. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. And when we come back, we answer some of your vaccine-related questions, including whether you might be able to choose which vaccine you get. But first, a little dose of hope and what life after the vaccine could look like. So, when I get the vaccine, eventually, if I can get the time off work, I am going to fly down and see my mom, my brother, my stepdad, who all live in Southern California. Welcome back. Today's news means some Canadians are getting closer to getting the COVID-19 vaccine in their arms. And no surprise, you have been filling our inboxes with questions. So tonight, we are going to get you some answers from Dr. Susie Hoda, an infectious diseases specialist. And, and Dr. Hoda, let's just get right to the first one. This is from Patrick in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Some vaccines require two doses, other one. If you get your first vaccine from the double dose one and the next vaccine, next time rather, it's not ready or there isn't available, will they give you one from a different uh, company? And is that okay or not? Uh, so mix and matching uh, vaccines, what do you think? Yeah, so right now the recommendation is not to interchange different types of vaccines for COVID-19. And the reason for that is we don't really know how that will affect the effectiveness of the vaccine. 
Also, if you got one vaccine and then a different one and developed uh, an adverse event or a side effect from it, it might be difficult for us to know if that was second, due to the second vaccine that you got or because of some interaction between the two vaccines. Um, that's something you know not necessarily just attributed to that second vaccine. Um, so lots of things to consider there. But, um, but I guess, so I mean, but the vaccines, they do have a shelf life though, right? So, so isn't it like entirely plausible that your first dose would be ready for you, but but I don't know, maybe your second dose gets stuck in shipping, which is something that, that I think he was trying to allude to there. Yeah, there are a lot of logistics behind how we're actually going to roll this out and implement it. And, you know, people will get vaccine vaccination cards and should keep their immunization cards with them so they're at least aware of what they got the first time around. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think we're going to have to see how this all plays out because we do expect different types of vaccines to become available on sort of a rolling format and uh, limited quantities at each time. So, um, you know, I, I think that the, the goal is to try and keep with the same vaccine that you got with the first dose with your second dose, because that's truly how they've been studied at, at this point. Right. OK, here's another question. This is from Mary in Mississauga, Ontario. Since we are not familiar with Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and we don't know the long term side effects, we will be able to choose uh, which vaccine we would like to be injected with. And so, Dr. Hoda, I feel like there, there are kind of two parts to that question. The first being the premise that we don't necessarily know if these vaccines are safe in the long term. Could, could you speak to that? Yeah, I did want to acknowledge that because it's an important thing that we're all, you know, trying to consider. And really, whenever we have any new therapeutic or vaccine come onto the market, we don't truly have a good sense of what the long term effects can be. And it's especially understandable that people would be concerned about that when we're dealing with completely novel types of vaccines coming onto the, the field. Um, so that really speaks to how important it is for us to do what we call post-marketing surveillance, and that's continuous monitoring for side effects that can happen that may or may not be related to vaccines um, that Health Canada will monitor. But if someone is so inclined or, or let's say particularly worried about specific vaccines, would they be able to choose which vaccine they get? I suspect we won't have the luxury of doing that, at least in the early stages of getting our vaccines, mostly because we'll have limited quantities of each ones that arise that arrive at different times. Um, so we'll probably have to get whatever's available at that time. And that can be OK as long as there isn't a major difference in effectiveness in subgroups or overall effectiveness of the different vaccine candidates or safety concerns within certain groups. Um, and, you know, when you think about it, when we get our flu shots every year, uh, there are a number of different types of flu vaccines that are out there, and we don't often know which one we're getting, but, you know, we're getting one of those different options. But that sort of raises a good question. Would folks necessarily know which vaccine they're getting, even if they don't get to choose which one they get? They should, and that should be logged on their immunization card because of this issue of the multiple doses and the need to try and keep to the same type of vaccine as you received the first time. All right, Dr. Susie Hoda, good to get your answers to those questions. Thank you very much. Welcome. Still ahead, we hear from a familiar face on the front lines of the pandemic what the first COVID-19 vaccine means to healthcare workers. Toronto ER doctor Tasleem Nimji reflects on this moment with us. But as we go to break, here's another chance to hear from you. Hi, my name is Emily, and once I get a vaccine, I'm very excited to finally go visit my Nana in her retirement home and give her the biggest hug I can possibly give her. Welcome back. So life didn't quite return to normal today, but still a glimmer of hope as Canada approves the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Most of us are still months away from getting the shot, but for some frontline workers, it could be a matter of days. So what does this mean to them? We went back to Dr. Tasleem Nimji at Humber River Hospital in Toronto to find out. My name is Dr. Thasleem Nimji and I'm an emergency physician at Humber River Hospital and the physician lead for the COVID emergency response here. If healthcare workers are amongst uh, one of the first groups to get the vaccine here in Canada, um, it means a significant exhale, I would say. Um, it's something that we have all wanted for a long time. So all of us have seen our patients, especially those that are vulnerable, especially the elderly, um, really suffer um, when affected by this virus. And we have seen families suffer 
through this. And so the thought that we could actually have a vaccine that is delivered first to these vulnerable populations to create a bit of a, a safety net for them that they have not had through this pandemic. We've never had a global community like this with so many people with their expertise all coming together, rallying around the same cause and feeling the urgency to get to that end product. And so I think that that's also something that we have to keep in mind when we ask those questions about how did this happen so quickly? This changes my life significantly as it does for everybody. Um, I would say when we get to the point where we're past just that sort of first layer in terms of vaccinating uh, those that are in the highest risk group and we're actually moving out to larger and broader sections of the community, this means that we get back some of our human connectedness that we can have in terms of face-to-face -face connections with those closest to us. And for me personally, there's no way to really express what this, the healthcare community has gone through when it comes to um, really dealing with our own vulnerability uh, when we were facing the vaccine, especially in wave one when we knew less than we do now, and having to go home each day to our families with that sort of in the back of your mind fear of am I going to make my children sick? Am I going to make my parents or my, or my spouse sick? You can't underestimate how much that weighs on people every day. We will look for leaders amongst us to, um, to get vaccinated, to speak about the values of vaccination, to help guide the public. There are others that like to get that information in their hands and really understand what this means to them personally. And for those people, I would say knowledge is power. Go out there and learn as much as you can about the vaccine to help you um, get ready to pull up your sleeve and get your vaccine for yourself. Okay, up next, a dream come true for one talented Canadian. I'm the new voice of Bugs Bunny. Meh. What's up, Doc? <laughs> That's pretty good. We introduce you to the man bringing the iconic cartoon to life in 2020. But first, more reflections on today's game-changing news. What will you do when you get the vaccine? The first thing that I would do once I get the vaccine is hug my friends and family who are not part of my bubble. Um, and then shortly after that, hopefully I'll take lots of vacations and travel. So most of tonight's program has very understandably been about COVID and the vaccine. But this next story is special and moving in an entirely different way. It's about Bugs Bunny, an icon who has endured in a pretty singular way, but who is now decidedly Canadian. We wanted you to meet the dreamer from Scarborough, Ontario, whose job it is to bring new life to that legacy. Hi, I'm Eric Bauza. I'm from Scarborough, Ontario, Canada. Okay, test, test, one, two. You guys can hear me in there okay? All right, here we go. Phew! <gasps> there we go. And, uh, I'm the new voice of Bugs Bunny. Meh. What's up, Doc? <laughs> <sighs> Phew! It's hot out there. Wonder if this joint has any box carrot water. When I first stepped into the voice booth as Bugs Bunny, it was surreal. Ah! It was like a dream come true. A wabbit? Hiya, Doc. Nice swimming hole you got here. Definitely a task that I was up for, but... Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy! It's just so hard to fill those shoes that Mel Blanc left behind. It was his original character, so he was free to do whatever he wanted with it. So you have to study up. You have to be on point when you are in character for Bugs. I'm sure this nice homeowner won't mind sharing his pool with the local wildlife. There we go. So on Looney Tunes cartoons, I voice... Bugs Bunny? Hey, uh, thanks, pal. And also... Daffy Duck? Nice to meet you, chum. Tweety Bird. Dwayne, there's a bad old putty cat outside trying to eat me. And Marvin the Martian, I claim this planet in the name of Mars. There's a photo <laughs> of myself wearing this Bugs Bunny shirt that I purchased from Six Flags Magic Mountains. It was grade eight. If I could go back in time and tell young Eric that I would be voicing Bugs Bunny in my later years, I think my reaction would be, uh... Ah, uh, whatever, Doc. I, I wouldn't believe it. I think it's just something that you just don't expect. Who grows up thinking that they're gonna voice Bugs Bunny? Not a lot of people. 
It's just serendipitous in a way. All of my parents' money that I spent on goofy clothes and toys is now coming back. I saved all the receipts, so I'm paying my parents back uh, every paycheck I get from Looney Tunes. Listen, Rabbit, everyone knows that I'm the star of Looney Tunes cartoons. Also, my father was a Canadian goose, so therefore, I've always been Canadian. You know, I miss Canada. I miss home, I miss uh, my family, I miss friends, but there's one major way I stay connected. Uh, I actually started this uh, big little brand by the name of Retro Kid with an old high school best friend, Steve Gaskin. We make t-shirts. It is basically our love letter to Toronto, paying homage to iconic Canadian TV shows and pop culture, like Mr. Dress Up. When you're a lonely Canadian in the US and you have an article of clothes that identifies you as being from Toronto, and a fellow Canadian finds you, it is like two unicorns finding each other in a, <laughs> in a big grassy field. You know, we look to the US for a lot of influence when it comes to entertainment, but we've also created so many original shows and programming from Canada. Oh, hello. You're here now, so I'll put my book down. The U.S. has Mr. Rogers, and Canada has Mr. Dressup. Mr. Dressup was an icon and definitely influenced my creative side as a kid. Anytime Mr. Dressup was at the drawing easel, I would always bring out my pad of paper and a pencil. Alligators have such big mouths, it's easy to make them smiling. What's amazing is that I'm watching it again with my son, and he loves it. You know, like, we're talking about a kid that's being raised in this digital age, and he is enjoying every minute of it. When I watch cartoons with my son, <laughs> he looks at me, and he starts doing voices too, and I think it's hilarious. I got out a booty patat. Of all the Looney Tunes voices that my son does, I think his best voice uh, is Bugs Bunny for sure. Me, What's up, Doc? All right, I think we found the next voice of Bugs Bunny. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna force him into the family business, but uh, if he wants to uh, be in animation, I would applaud him 100%. <laughs> oh man, that's good stuff. What's next for Eric Bowser? I'm just watching the news and preparing for when it's safe for my son and I to hop on a plane and come home. I want to come home and, and hug my mom and dad. Head home to the Great White North, eh? Meh. That's all, folks. Everything about Eric is a love letter to Canada. Next on The National, marking today's groundbreaking vaccine news. Plans for the future. Imagine that. What Canadians want to do after they get the shot in our moment next. This was a day that had many Canadians celebrating and dreaming about what they will do after they get the vaccine. So you've heard some of those stories throughout the program, but tonight we wanted to turn our moment back over to you. The first thing that I would do once there's a COVID vaccine would be to get on a plane and to fly somewhere very hot and lay on a beach. The first thing that I want to do once I'm vaccinated is going back to my workplace and meet my colleagues. I would also like to meet my best friends from my university and drink lots of coffee with them. I'm just excited that it's, it's been a very short period of time that we had to wait because we've had a long year. Well, I'm really excited to get back to class. I really miss being in the classroom. Online school has been kind of tough. The first thing I would do once I get the vaccine is go visit my parents and my in-laws for the weekend. I look forward to visiting my parents in Calgary. I haven't seen them in over a year now. My mom is high risk for COVID, which makes visiting very difficult. And once I safely can do so, I really look forward to it. The first thing that I would do once I get the vaccine is hug my friends and family who are not part of my bubble. And then shortly after that, hopefully I'll take lots of vacations and travel. <laughs> so I can totally relate. I, I, this makes me feel good to hear this. Mm -hmm. I feel like I do have to be that guy to remind people, of course, yeah. that the vaccine is still months away and, and the second dose is weeks after the first dose. Immunity comes after the second dose and, and then efficacy is still somewhat Yeah, it's, it's not done yet. Yes. But the dreaming is irresistible, yes. right? Like, yeah. I miss the world very much <laughs> and I really want to have host, like, a big, noisy, casual dinner party and... <laughs> 
Yes. Maybe I'll even be there. Who you knows? You will. <laughs> that is the National for December the 9th. Good night. Good night.